So we have Roger McNamee, who is sitting here, and he is the author of this book, which I brought, uh, called Duck. And he's got some really interesting story to tell us, I think. Um, I met Roger actually last year at the first Truth and Technology Conference. And Barry is uh, with the Open Markets I'm sorry, I get Institute. Definitely. Institute, okay. yes. And he also has some interesting stories. So uh, I thought I would start, because I think you both are, uh, have been advocating for using, the, sort of reviving the antitrust laws and using them to break up the really big tech platforms. And sort of how you got to, to that conclusion. What made you think that this was a, a good way to go? Oh, um, I mean, what we've been advocating for, and this goes back, uh, in our case, about 10 years, uh, you know, for a long time, our, just a little background is uh, Open Markets was a program at a think tank called New America. And then for the last year and a half, we've been independent. Uh, and, uh, you know, so going back to about 2009, uh, when, around the time I was finishing my book, Cornered, uh, started to focus a lot on the power of of Amazon and of Google, especially at that time, Facebook really hadn't emerged as a major middleman yet. And uh, what was becoming evident is even though you'd seen all this massive consolidation of power in the political economy of the United States, because of this change in policy that had taken place in the early years of Reagan vis-a-vis -vis monopoly, um, that we were about to see a whole nother level of concentration of power uh, as sort of the platforms really emerged into sort of full bloom. Uh, so, uh, you know, we started to focus on Amazon and, and Google, you know, 2009, 2010. And what we saw, the problem, just short and really briefly, is that uh, these, these organizations, these enterprises, these monopolies, have established themselves in between people who sell things and people who buy things but rather than serving as a neutral platform in which the seller and the buyer come together and do a deal or exchange information, uh, they have exploited some licenses that they were given by the new antitrust regime established in the Reagan years uh, to become the middlemen, the manipulators of the interactions between sellers and buyers. Uh, so the reason that we see them as a problem is because they've taken that power to manipulate interactions between sellers and buyers, writers and readers, you know, thinkers and, the, and musicians and the people who enjoy what, you know, what people are thinking and what pe the music people are making, is they're using this to empower themselves and to disempower all the rest of us. Uh, so that's uh, why, you know, for a number of years now, but especially the last two years, we've really been focusing on the need to take these institutions and neutralize them. And we could talk a little bit more about what that neutralization might look like. Great. Yeah. Thank you, so, Roger. So I spent 34 years as a technology optimist, as an analyst covering the tech industry and investor in it. I was lucky enough to meet Mark Zuckerberg when he was 22 and Facebook was two years old. And I was able to help him solve a crisis and therefore became an advisor to him for three years. In 2016, I began to notice, and it's really embarrassing that I didn't see it earlier, but I began to notice things that did not conform to my understanding of what Facebook was all about and what was legitimate for a social network and what was not. The result of which was I reached out to Mark and Cheryl before the election in 2016. They treat it like a PR problem. I spent three months trying to begging them to take it seriously, and they chose not to, and I became an, uh, an activist to try to make the world aware of what I saw. And here's the fundamental economic problem. Imagine it's 2002 and you're Google. You have one product, it's a search engine, and you do exactly what any good marketer does. You gather data from your customer in order to improve the product or service that you offer to that customer. It's search, search is a from your point of view, your advertising business is about the intent to purchase things. Purchase intent is very valuable because you can tie ads to a search for a vacation or a search for a hammer right on the thing and everybody wins. It's a great business. They discover only two or three percent of the data is required to make the product better. 
So they do an analysis to see if there's any value in the rest fit. And they discover that there is signal related to behavioral prediction. Unfortunately, it's not very valuable because they don't know who the people are or where they are. So they create a product called Gmail. And they, get, they have an unbelievable insight, which is Gmail will give them identity, which you can tie to purchase intent, and that will give them a massive competitive advantage in advertising. It will essentially allow them to reproduce Amazon without any inventory. But if you're going to be in the purchase intent, sorry, if you're going to be in the behavioral prediction business, right, if, if you perceive that you're not advertising, you're really about behavioral prediction, well, what is email? Email is a system in which people share their activities. If you want to predict their future, just read their emails. So they constructed the product with ads. And they said to people, it's a free product. We're going to put ads in there in order to pay for it. And we need to scan the emails in order to target the ads. And we all fell for it. They knew we were going to push back on the ads, and we did. They got rid of them, but they didn't stop scanning the emails. So this is exactly analogous to Federal Express opening every one of your packages and reading what's in it with a machine, or the Postal Service doing the same thing. But we let them get away with it. Obvious law, violation of the law, we've just never applied the law. They then went on and do the same thing with, with maps, right? Google Maps is, an, is a surveillance product. They provide massively convenient services, but they track you everywhere. They then have this giant insight, which is there's all this unclaimed data in the world. So they start driving cars up and down the street, and they create street view. They take a picture of your house with your kids and dog in front. They don't ask your permission. They simply declare they own it. They control it. They can monetize it. The Germans freak out completely. Everybody else lets them get away with it. They do satellite view to get from the top, Google Glass to get it up close. We push back on Google Glass. We call them glass holes. So they <laughs> repackage it as a video game. And they make the world's most popular video game. You guys know it as Pokemon Go, which is Google Glass using the phone to do all the surveillance. You're getting pictures of everyone. And then you get to try the second wave. So they've gone from. The original plan was just good targeting. Now we want to try behavioral manipulation. And the way you do it with Pokemon Go is you start creating offers. Can you get somebody who is proximate to a coffee shop to go into the coffee shop? And that experiment was magnificently successful. Then they realized there's all this data around in the world that you can buy. People's financial data from credit card transactions, from credit re reporting, from banks health and wellness data from apps, right? Location from cell phones, all that kind of stuff. They buy all that. They construct a data avatar for each and every one of us. And if we're on an Android, the resolution of this is infinitely high. And you simply would not believe all the data that an Android phone is gathering on you and where it gathers it. The fact that when you're not connected to a network, it runs full time. And Android is in every single Internet of Things device out there that's not made by Apple. And all they do is surveillance all day long. So what's the problem with that? I think behavioral manipulation is just a really horrible thing. I think that's like not American. And the problem with it is that these guys have gotten a complete monopoly of advertising. Every ad product online has Google Analytics embedded in it. So they're getting all of that data. All the ad exchanges touch Google in one place or another, right? AdMob is two-thirds of the market. So you have this which situation. Which is owned by Google. Just which is owned yeah. by Google. And so Google completely owns the relationship between marketers and consumers. Facebook has almost as good a position with a slightly different twist. So imagine perfect information offered to marketers, but with a Faustian bargain. They destroy bread because anybody can get it. Now imagine the consumer. The consumer only gets the data that the platform is willing to give them. That is not capitalism. Capitalism requires uncertainty on both sides. And they've eliminated that. Certainty I just is, if you sit there and think about what agency is, if you think about what human being, what self-determination is, certainty is the elimination of that. And so I think we need antitrust here, because I think that this is undermining the basic mechanics of our economy. And we're running out of time. So how do I guess what I'm not clear about is how antitrust is going to help here. 
like, so my experience is at the, when I was at the Department of Justice, this was after the AT&T was broken up. And AT&T is a very good um, sort of comparison because it was a monopoly. It, it had complete control over our, all of our telephone calls and the telephone equipment and the research that was being done in the area. And the government brought a lawsuit in 1974 and it finally settled it in 1981. It was a huge amount of resources went into investigating it. Uh, I think it probably would have been squashed, but some people at the Justice Department were, were recused them from the case so they couldn't stop it. The Department of Defense certainly wanted to stop it. And um, then they lucked out and they got a judge, I think it was the second judge assigned to the case, who was really smart. Judge Green. Yes, and knew how to, to manage this massive case. And then when they settled it, there, was, there took many, many years to actually dismantle this system because you had, you know, all these different regions. They had to create new companies. They had, everyone had to pick their primary long distance carrier. Uh, they had to de de develop these ladders, which were, I don't want to, lots of stuff. And, um, and so I think it did in unleash a lot of innovation at the time. Well, Angela, it, I mean, it brought cellular phones forward at least 10 years and it created the internet because there would never have been a broadband data market without the breakup of AT&T. Well, okay, let, let me finish my story and then you can explain that because I'm really interested no, in that. No, but I mean, yeah. I, where you're going is you're asking the question, what does antitrust do? In tech, antitrust creates new industries. Sure, but they then they got back together, though. That's what, I mean, now, you know, you basically well, have so AT&T AT and Verizon because we don't have net neutrality. We have, like, two major No, no, companies. I get that, but we got right? the Internet. We got this whole massive new industry. Before you had a monopoly and no Internet. Now you have a monopoly and Internet. Well, but we're demonstrably better off. Okay, I, maybe. But I, th I think that there was also a lot of unintended consequences. Yeah, I, I think what you're, you're also, what you're missing here, or what's the, the, what's, you're, n you're not necessarily missing, but you're, you're leaving out of this story, is the radical change that was imposed on America's anti-monopoly regime in the late 70s and early 80s. And what, you know, one way to understand what happened is, you know, going back to the very beginning of our country, going back to actually beyond the beginning of our country, 1773, the Boston Tea Party. It's like, what was that? That was an action. You know, some people say, oh, it was an action against, you know, overtaxation. What it was actually against was an action against monopoly. And people said, we are not going to have the British East India Company serving as an intermediary between the buyers and sellers of America, between the citizens of America who sell things and the citizens of America who buy things. So America was born out of a rebellion against monopoly and was created. The structuring of America, the Declaration, the, the Constitution, the Northwest Ordinance, these were the great anti-monopoly documents of our time, long before the Sherman Act. They were all like, we will be independent individuals. We will have liberty. We will have democracy. And we will have liberty and democracy by breaking all powers out there, ensuring that no one has any kind of power to control us, to manipulate us. And what happened? And that worked. That worked remarkably well for 200 years. We, we lost control for about 15 years at the time of the plutocrats. But we got control back after the election in 1912. What happened? 35 years ago, is the Chicago schoolers came along, the libertarians came along, and they radically changed the philosophy that we use to interpret all of our anti-monopoly laws. You know, so you know, there's not just the Sherman Act. I mean, we have hundreds and hundreds of laws out there that are designed to be anti-monopoly laws, to break power, to neutralize networks that we need to rely on. And what those folks did 35, 40 years ago is they said, all of this focus on protecting liberty, all this focus on protecting democracy is wasteful. It's wasteful. It's inefficient. We need to take our laws and make them efficient so that we can create more stuff for you, the consumer. And they went in there and they changed the basic frames through which we see all of our anti-monopoly law. And they scratched out, literally scratched out the word citizen. And they wrote in the word consumer. And they said, the purpose of our anti-monopoly laws is to promote the welfare of the consumer, which was a euphemism for promoting efficiency, which itself was a euphemism for promoting monopoly. 
So they turned our anti-monopoly laws on their head and turned them into laws that promote monopoly. The AT&T case was a relic of the previous regime. It was for a variety of reasons. Mr. Baxter, who was in power at that time, decided to go uh, forward with it. But from 1982 on, we've been living in a radically different world. And our, that's why we have such a huge problem today with Google, Facebook, and Amazon. Um, so let me go back to something that Roger said that, that intrigued me. So the, the manipulation, I agree, that's a really big problem, and it's especially a problem for kids, but it's a real problem for all of us. We, we can't really understand what they're doing with our data. It's all, they don't tell us. Uh, yeah. And we probably wouldn't understand it anyhow. But so how does, but how would breaking up some of these platforms, assuming it could even be done, how does it stop them from manipulating us um, in, in the ways that you've described? That's a great question. So, so Angela, I see two parts to the problem. So the history of antitrust and tech begins in 1956 with the first AT&T consent decree, which forces AT&T to remain only a telco, allowing the computer industry to happen and taking the transistor, putting it in the public domain, which creates Silicon Valley. The IBM case in, in the 60s creates the software industry and by extension PCs. The AT&T case, as I said, brings forward um, cellular and makes broadband. The Microsoft case creates today's internet. So in each case, the target goes to an all-time high. So I'm a big fan of it politically because while the things, to your point, you correctly make the statement, which is the target remains a problem, but at least you get a new industry, okay? So I like that piece of it to your first question. Relative to the data issues and the manipulation and control, I think you have to go after the business model I think it's, you know, I strongly support Senator Warren's position relative to eliminating the notion of people who make markets being allowed to also compete in them. I think that's the fundamental element of her argument. And there's lots of versions of that. There's Amazon's marketplace where they also have basics and they use the data from the marketplace to compete with people who are in it. These are the ad markets of Google and Facebook where they make the market and then have the most successful products inside them, right? So that's clearly, that's clearly a really important thing to do. I think the data sharing across products in a monopoly is an enormous barrier to entry. I think Google and Amazon, Microsoft and Facebook buying up all of the AI people is a huge problem. And so we have to prevent that. And then we have to eliminate the other side of the coin. The way you really get rid of manipulation is you get rid of the, the use of data that is private in a commercial context as a third party commercial context. So imagine this case, you know, you, you make a credit card payment, right? That data goes to Data Logics or somebody like that. They are now free to sell that data. Now I go, excuse me, why is that legal? Why is it legal for uh, Equifax or Experian to sell my credit history to anybody who wants it? Why is it legal for my bank, right? I don't get why that's legal. I don't get why it's legal for a health and wellness app, which if they were in a hospital, I do not believe would be able to sell anything. Why is it legal to have them sell my heart rate or for a woman, their menstrual cycle, right? Why is that legal? Why is it legal for, for a cellular company to, to sell location data or for Uber or Lyft to give it to Google and then have Google use it, right? I mean, these are things that go on in the economy today, Angela, that, I think empower this manipulation. And so if you think about this problem that we are both a human being and a data avatar, if you want to take away the power of the data avatar, you have to take away those elements of the data over which you have no control, in which you get no economic benefit in that use case. And you pair that with the antitrust, and then I think you have a complete solution, which is not to say we're going to destroy Google and Facebook so much as we're going to return them to the days of better ad targeting and get them out of the manipulation business and get them out of the business of selling certainty. Actually, the, um, I, mean, I agree with everything that Roger just said. And I think that's actually there's even a slightly simpler way to actually look at the challenge. And 
And it's actually, it's, it's very reassuring because when we look at the challenge in this way, we see that we actually, we have all the tools we need today to deal with this problem today. And these are all tools that we've proven in the past. You know, it's like the, the problem of manipulation, the problem of people looking into your private business, the problem of people of huge asymmetries of information, it's not actually new. We, this was true in the case of AT&T in 1912. It was true of, of the railroads in the late 19th century. They knew everything about your business, and you knew nothing about your neighbor's business, and they had the opportunity to manipulate every single person who used the railroad. Or AT&T had the ability, to the capability of manipulating everybody who used that network. But what we did back then is we, we applied laws to ensure that they did not manipulate people. And we said, and these laws were called common carriage laws. And what it meant is you will not discriminate in the, how you treat anybody who's using your railroad, who's using your network. You will treat everyone the same. We'll give them the same terms of service. You will give them the same pricing. That means on both sides, both as a seller and as a buyer. Same pricing, same terms of service, no discrimination. You are neutral. You're a provider of service. You shall not interfere in other people's business. And we've used that time and again. You could trace this basic common carriage laws back to Roman times. We could trace these back to Babylonian times as applies to things like ferry boats and stagecoaches. There's nothing new here. There's one other thing. When you turn to break up, sometimes you'll hear like Senator Warren talking about breaking things up. Sometimes you break up network monopolies along vertical lines to reinforce this sense of neutrality. And an example would be in the case, like uh, books, Amazon. Amazon sells everybody's books. They're the dominant platform in which people buy and sell books. What Amazon has done is they've also vertically integrated into the sale of books, into the, the, the publishing of books. They publish books under various imprints that are owned by Amazon. That puts them into competition with the people who rely on them to get to market. That gives them, and when you're in competition with people who rely on you, what are you going to do? What's your interest lead you to do? It leads you to put your book in front of someone else's book and sell your book instead of someone else's book. That's called a conflict of interest. So time and again, we, uh, over the years, we say, you who have control a network monopoly, a railroad, you know, AT&T, the, the electrical monopolies, the electrical utilities, you shall not, the banks, you shall not compete with people who rely on you for your services. Period. The end. We did this most recently with Microsoft back in, in uh, the late 1990s. That was a vertical integration decision that resulted in a decision to split Microsoft up. But the simple, the simple goal is always neutrality so that the middleman is as thin as possible and, and, and interferes in your business never. Um, do we have questions from the audience? We only have five minutes left, and I'm sure we do. I what, can get him a microphone. You mentioned common carrier regulation, and of course Mark Zuckerberg just the other day in a well-known op-ed said that he wanted to be regulated, he wanted to be controlled, and for the government to tell him what he should carry on his network. Uh, now all that leads really to regulatory capture ultimately, and I think that's the point that Tim Wu and another number of scholars have made. Uh, that's what enabled AT&T to get so big after 1912. Uh, and so how are you going to deal with create, if you do common carrier regulation, you're es essentially entrenching the monopoly that Facebook has now. Uh, you may be entrenching the monopoly on search that Google has. How, how would you deal with that? Verti getting rid of vertical integration is one thing, but you're still going to end up with a monopoly. Uh, the second half of my question is Tim Wu makes a big point of in his book, uh, which I'm sure you, you all know and people here probably know, uh, about the master switch, that information industries like this go in big cycles. Monopoly, a, a new technology comes in, overtakes it, and I trust might act, and then, you know, within a couple of decades, we're back into a monopoly again. I'm just curious your comments on those points. 
Yeah, so, um, you know, in terms of, uh, I mean, Tim, Tim's on our advisory board, well, actually along with, with Roger, um, and, um, you know, Tim's an old friend. I've known him since 2006 at, when we were both in New America. Um, and um, the, you know, the regulation is like the AT&T approach between the United States government and AT&T, um, it, the United States made decisions about whether to actually promote competition or not in 1913, when it was actually restructuring the uh, AT&T and splitting uh, uh, Western Union off from AT&T. There was a decision that we're not gonna necessarily promote more competition. We want this, this network to string long lines from one side of the United States to another, so they, we're gonna let the monopoly exist. 1982, you jump ahead, they said, no, we're gonna break it up. Those were two different decisions. So the idea that, it, that regulatory capture is necessarily going to happen when you have common carriage rules is actually not at all the case. That's actually, it's been proven, disproven multiple times. There's so many different ways that you can actually create uh, sort of horizontal rivalry. You know, people are talking about, you know, creating standardization across platforms so you can move your data from one to the other. That actually creates horizontal rivalry. So the idea of, comp of that kind of lock-in uh, is absolutely 100% avoidable. Uh, but what you end up with is a neutral platform that serves you as opposed to serving you up to someone else. And to be clear, if we don't get rid of the business model, if we don't get rid of the, the, the data part of the economy, I think your point holds more often than not in the sense that their power, you know, there's no regulator who can stop them at their current scale if you allow the current business practices. So Roger, when you talk about changing the business practices, are you talking about it's the free in return we get to advertise for you model? No. Or can you, I mean, what like, do you mean? How would you think change of, it? Think of their market the business model as having had three stages. It begins with targeted ads. That's the thing that we pay for when we give up our data. We're getting a service in exchange for targeted ads. I got no problem with that, so I'm cool with that. I have that a problem with that, that fine. for kids, too. Well, for kids, I get it, <laughs> yeah. but I'm just saying, in general, society allows ad targeting. It has for decades in a variety of areas, and so you know, you're either going to have to ban it across a lot more than these guys or go with it. The second one is behavioral manipulation. Some people are actually okay with what recommendation engines do, what filter bubbles do. I personally am not, but we can have that debate. Then the third one is certainty. And certainty is the case of Google CAPTCHA, where they, you know, you think you're defining you're a human being by identifying road signs and traffic lights and all that stuff. You're really training Google's self-driving car artificial intelligence. They know you're a human by your mouse movement. Imagine the scenario that they track your mouse movement over a period of years. All of a sudden, it gets slower and more wobbly. It's literally the first indication you have Parkinson's disease. And they've seen it because they, your system is tracking that exact thing. Now, the problem with the market that they're in, if they, were in a, if they viewed us as a customer, they would call us right up. And obviously, that technology could make a great insurance product. But that's not how they think. We're not even their product as they would be in, in their ad business. We're the fuel. They just want the data. They're not obligated to tell us. They're not obligated to protect our privacy. They have the ability to sell it to the highest bidder, and they're selling certainty. Certainty has a very high value, especially if you sell it to an insurance company that raises our rates or eliminates our coverage, and we still don't know we have a disease, right? That's where they're going. That's why. Alexa and Google Home and Android are going everywhere because they're essentially going to take the behavioral manipulation so they can guide to guaranteed outcomes. So I want to eliminate the ability to do that. I want to force them back into the original business model and call it a day. Now, they're going to be a lot less profitable than they are today, but I would argue that this is like the chemical industry. We let them pour mercury into fresh water. We let them leave mine tailings on the side of a hill. We let gas stations pour old uh, oil into the sewer. And then one day we woke up and realized that these externalities had a huge cost and the people who created them should pay them. I would argue these guys are creating massive toxic digital spills and they should pay the cost. And that will bring them back to the market size that they were originally. I think we have a question over here.
With that being said, regarding children, common sense, protection, safety, and security, could you guys expand on that and the benefits of the antitrust and breakup as it relates to why we're here? Yeah. Benefits. Benefits of breaking up? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I want to make a couple points. Um, this is actually my only a disagreement with um, Roger, which is these corporations are, I agree with Roger, these corporations are awesomely powerful. And actually, just to make sure that we understand the true nature of the threat, these are the gravest, these corporations pose the gravest threat to our democracy that we have seen in this country, perhaps since the Civil War. You know, the, the, the chokehold they have over the news, the chokehold they have over information flows, the chokehold they have over commerce, over the, kids, over, and the chokehold they have over individuals is increasingly absolute. But that's also why we are going to deal with this problem in the very near future. I mean, and here's where I disagree with Roger. Roger said no regulator, you know, we're getting to the point where regulators don't have the power to deal with this. This is the United States of America. The regulator is you, every one of you. You know, we've got 320 million people in this country, and it's like you add all of us up, and you know what? It's like we are so much awesomely more powerful than Google and Facebook and Amazon, those little boys out there in Silicon Valley. We're 320 million of us. We're afraid of those little boys. Well, and can we're I going to, so it's like we are going to regulate the hell out of these folks. And it's like we are going to end up with an institution, with institutions that promote good journalism that promote good behavior, you know, uh, that pr uh, allow kids to thrive when they go online. Well, you know, can, let me yeah. insert something here, because I really strongly agree with this. Relative to kids, I left out of my list of things I want to add. Why is it legal to even collect data on minors? They have no ability to give consent. You know, I heard earlier today that parents are doing the consenting. I'm going, I'm sorry, I do not believe under any circumstances any data of any kind should be held on anyone under 18 years old, under any circumstances. And so what I'm trying to eliminate, is I want to give that right to everyone over 18 also, okay? But I want to start with the under 18. The reason I'm here is because I believe politically, so where Barry and I are completely aligned is I think the 2020 election should make this issue front and center, starting with the places where there's existing legal frameworks. We don't have to have any new bureaucracy. Clearly, protecting children is one of them. Clearly, the common carrier status relative to email and documents is another place, right? And I would argue that we can make similar cases on health data and on location. And the core point of this is that I've been testing this notion in a lot of different political environments. And what I've discovered, it's not an issue of right and left. It's an issue of right and wrong. And this is a profound thing. And the kids element of it relative to, to going after not just the antitrust, but the other side, regulating the data. The kids is the strongest single argument you have because everybody goes, yeah, wait a minute, why are they collecting? Why is that legal at all? I don't care. I mean, why is there a Chromebook in a school? All the Chromebooks, therefore, is to collect the data. They can de-anonymize it with three data points. I mean, you wind up putting your address in somewhere else. It's like, excuse me, of course they know who it is. I mean, why do we allow that? We shouldn't, and we should make that a 2020 election issue. Every party, every candidate, from City Hall, President of the United States. See, I, I just don't see how you would ever get the legislation would outlaw the things that you think should be outlawed. I, not that I disagree with you on the substance. Why don't we take it up for test drive well, and find out? Well, okay. no, I'd love to, but we've, you know, a lot of people have been trying to raise a lot of issues like this for a very long time. Right. I don't think it's simple. I think part of the reason is because when we heard Cameron talk earlier, the kids are spending all their time cultivating their image online and talking to their, texting to their friends and playing video games, and they're not politically organizing. Uh, but I'm not expecting, Angela, yeah. I, I totally understand true. the point you're making. I'm simply observing that for 40 years, there were no successful teacher labor actions. We've had five and six months. You know, the air traffic controllers with a two-hour partial sick out ended a government shutdown. McDonald's conceded the $15 an hour minimum wage. I'm going, if we aren't at the beginning of something new, 
we're totally screwed. I prefer to believe that we're at the beginning of something new. And I may be wrong, but I'm going to give my best shot to drive that sucker home. No, you're right. Um, and what you're saying is like every single tool that we need to deal with every one of these powers is laying here in this toolbox. And what, just so you understand, is like what, you know, I talked before about the, the, what the Chicago schoolers did, what the libertarians did, what Reagan and Thatcher did when they came to power, when they, and it was, there were folks from the left who helped them, when they came along with this new philosophy, is they hid the tools that we had used in this country going back to the founding to deal with power. But as we take this parasitic philosophy out of our head, as we put on new glasses and we suddenly see how we used to do things in this country, how the laws were actually structured, the purpose of the laws, then suddenly we look down and we're like, oh my God, every single hammer and saw and ax that I need to deal with this is laying right there. OK, any question? My one observation is we don't need to elect anybody in 2020 who doesn't make this issue important, okay? Right now you've got two people who've surfaced it seriously, but we've got another year and a half to go. Let's make sure everybody is putting this issue front and center. Can you say who you are? Who yes, you uh, my name is Robert Benton. I work with a group called the Counter Extremism Project. Um, and Roger, thank you for all the great work you've been doing on these issues. Um, so. My question or point is this that I'd like you to respond to. Um, I think we have seen with uh, attacks in New Zealand and the law that was passed in Australia yesterday, the effect, the quick effect, that a tragedy can have on some of these problems that we're dealing with here. Um, I think the um, election meddling in 2016 may be another example of that. I guess what I'm asking for you is I don't like the idea of tragedy and change. But in an effort to head off some of that, in your perspective, what, what are we headed for? I know, Roger, you talk a lot about why is this legal, which I think is important, but do you see that, what is the train wreck coming that we should try to avoid, the tragedy that might actually cause the change you know, that we're talking about? Well, I think in this country we're immune to tragedy, right? We've had a dozen terrorist events. Well, maybe that's a little high. Eight to 10 terrorist events driven by internet stuff that we completely walked past. You know, we didn't do anything after 2016. The, the voters who are most suppressed it, right, suburban white women, people of color, and idealistic young people turned out in surprisingly huge numbers in 2018. But I, I view this very simply. The internet is being broken up. It's being balkanized. So what we're losing is the thing that we liked about the internet in its good days, OK? And we probably, I mean, what, another way to fix this probably would be to require authenticated identity for everyone. That would go after a big part of the problem. But in the absence of authenticated identity, I think countries are going to start to close off their internet. And we're going to lose a lot of the power of the current thing. And that, I don't know if that's going to be good or bad, right? I mean, the design of the internet is deeply flawed. Not requiring identity was a terrible mistake. Not putting in any circuit breakers or um, you know, containment strategy for emotional contagion, that was a terrible mistake. Um, and I don't know how we're going to fix that. But what I do know is that the political process is our most expedient tool. And I totally agree with Angela, this is not going to be easy. I'm not pretending that for a minute. What I am suggesting, though, is that I think there are actually 339 million of us and only 1 million of them. And I like our odds. And I've been doing this on Fox. I've been doing this on MSNBC. I've been doing it on conservative talk radio. I've been doing it on NPR. And everybody reacts the same way, which is, wait a minute, why is all that stuff that way? There are actual laws that should protect us on every one of the things these guys are doing. I mean, you can't buy a, so we saw a demo earlier today, Sony TV. If you buy a Sony TV today, you cannot use it without agreeing to the terms of service for Android even if you don't plug it into your network. I mean, what the hell is up with that? <laughs> well, unfortunately, I, we have run out of time. I wish we had more time. <laughs> what the hell is up with that? <laughs>